everybody one welcome back to another video in today's video i'm going to be talking about what is a chemical bond and what are the different types of chemical bonds so let's begin well the first and the most inevitable question according to me is that what is a chemical bond okay so as a student of class 11th chemistry i would just pictureize a chemical bond as some solid interaction okay a solid joining kind of entity which is joining the two different atoms together and that is what a bond according to me should be like okay but that is not true a chemical bond is not a solid entity okay it is not something which is solid and which is joining the two atoms together it is just an interaction okay an attractive of course interaction which is holding a molecule together okay we all know how atoms combine to form molecules right so how are these molecules held together with the help of attractive interactions which are called chemical bonds right so we might represent a hydrogen molecule like this okay where we just represent a small line in between the two hydrogen atoms uh, but this line actually is not a solid line okay this line actually represents an interaction between the two hydrogen atoms and that is what a chemical bond is the second most inevitable question according to me is that why do atoms even combine okay so we know how atoms combine to form molecules and that is okay but why are they even doing that okay why can't just just they stay as like they are so the reasons uh, if you ask this question to a pool of people this is what you will get the first one is to complete its octet which means eight electrons in its outermost shell okay the second one is to complete its duplet which is two electrons in its outermost shell and the third one is the for atoms to become molecules well all this is not wrong okay all this is true but it's not the reasons why atoms combine okay the reason as to why atoms combine to form molecule is one which is energy okay energy is something which is controlling everything starting from you me to the different atoms also well everybody wants to be in a lower energy state even we also want to be stable in lives okay settled in lives the same thing is with the atoms atoms do not want to be at a state of high energies or excited states no the atoms want to be at lower energy states or stable states and that is what happens to them when they combine to form molecules okay so when uh, any kind of bond is formed it results in lower lower energy system or lower overall energy of the system and that is why atoms combine to form molecules okay now we know how energy is a conserved thing okay it is not something which can be created or it's not something which can be uh, destroyed right so if we are saying that atoms are losing their energy when they are forming bonds where is this lost energy going this lost energy is going nowhere but in the environment and that is why whenever a bond is formed it is also accompanied by evolution of some kind of energy which is in form of heat or light and that is why whatever bond it is i in a covalent it's always an exothermic reaction now let's talk about what are the different types of chemical bonds okay so before doing that we should know how our periodic table is consisting of three different kinds of elements we have metals non metals and metalloids the metals are highly electropositive okay on the left hand side we have all the metals which are highly electropositive which means they want to give away their electron okay and become positive electropositive right whereas non metals are highly electronegative which means they are ready to take up electrons and become electronegative okay that's what your non metals are this would be a better image to understand it because uh, as we go from left to right in periodic table from metals to non metals the size is going to get reduced okay and uh, the electronegativity is increasing the met uh, non metals are highly electronegative and metals are highly electropositive okay so what happens in an ionic bond ionic bond is a bond between a metal and a non metal okay so metals want to give away its electron and non metals want to take up electrons i think that's a match made in heaven because that is exactly what happens in your ionic bonds in case of your ionic bonds as you can see on your screen there's an example sodium is having one electron in its valence shell and it is giving out its one electron to the fluorine atom and becoming fluoride okay so we have this uh, molecule which is sodium fluoride which is an ionic bond okay so here we have complete transfer of electrons a total give and take of electron which is going to take place and uh, this kind of ionic bond is also called an electrovalent bond okay so because of complete transfer of electrons we have cations and anions we have total ions which are formed we have a positive ion and we have a negative ion which is formed okay the one which is giving away its electron is becoming positive which is cation and the one which is taking up is becoming neg negative which is an anion okay and this is also called an electrovalent bond now let's see what is happening in a covalent bond okay so covalent bond is a bond which is formed between a non metal and a non metal right so there's no 
taking up and giving up electrons in this case we have sharing of electrons right so the electron pair is shared between the two combining atoms together and the electron pair which is shared is coming one from each atom and that's why we have a equal sharing of electrons between the two participating atoms right so we have sharing here and the second thing is there are no ions which are formed just like in case of your ionic bonds we have total cations and ions which are formed there but that is not the case here but polarity may exist so we'll see what polarity is in a while and Shared electrons must belong to both the atoms. Okay. Okay. Now moving on, we have covalent bonds. So before discussing about what is polarity, we should know what what is electronegativity, right? So electronegativity is nothing but a tendency, okay, of an atom to attract the shared pair towards itself. So we know how your shared pair is being, uh, you know, is a part of both the combining atoms, right? But and it should be there exactly in between both the atoms, shared by both of them equally, right? But because of high electron negativity some atoms may attract it more towards themselves and that is the you know tendency of electronegativity in this case you can see fluorine is highly electronegativity having the value of 4 these values are on Pauling scale okay and you must remember these because they're quite handy and uh, lithium as you can see is having least electronegativity right so if we take an example of carbon and oxygen okay uh, if I just uh, make a covalent bond between these two I would expect the shared pair to lie exactly in between carbon and oxygen right because it's a shared pair but it's not true because of higher electronegativity of oxygen the shared pair is more towards oxygen okay and because of this shared pair shifting more towards oxygen because of high electronegativity of oxygen there is kind of polarity which is created poles positive and negative poles which are created remember these are not charges okay just like at ions and anions no these are poles and that is called a polar covalent bonds a delta positive and delta negative charge is created okay a delta negative on the one which is more electronegative which is oxygen in this case and delta positive which is uh, carbon in this case whereas in case of other different atoms like in case of chlorine chlorine we would expect in a covalent bond the uh, shared pair to be exactly in between okay and also in case of uh, other different covalent bonds like c and h where the difference is not very high okay again we would expect the shared pair to be exactly in between that is called a non-polar covalent bond so just to sum it apart we have ions which are formed in case of your ionic bond we have polarity in polar covalent bond and we have completely non-polar system in case of your non-polar covalent bond now let's know what is a coordinate bond okay so a coordinate bond is exactly same as what you called a covalent bond because here also we have a sharing of electrons between two atoms right but the difference is that in covalent bond we have the shared pair which is denoted by one from each atom right whereas in this case the shared pair of electron both the electrons are donated by one atom okay and it is shared between the two different atoms right the one which is donating is called the donor of course and the one which is accepting is called the acceptor so as an example we have a molecule of ammonia where we know that ammonia molecule has a single lone pair of electron which is free okay which is localized on the uh, nitrogen atom and here we have a hydrogen proton okay a hydrogen proton as you all know does not have any electron now this lone pair is donated from the ammonia molecule to the hydrogen uh, proton and this adduct is formed okay of course ammonia in this case is the donor and proton is in this case is the acceptor let us finally talk about what is a metallic bond okay so a metallic bond is a bond between different metal atoms right now we already know how metals are uh, very much electropositive in nature which means they would definitely want to convert into electropositive form and then exist right giving out its electron is something they just love to do right so they exist in this form where they give out their electron and they exist the positive charges exist in a pool of electron right so one would expect all the positive charges to repel each other right because positive positive should repel but they are actually attractive because we have a pool of electrons and that is called a metallic bond which is again an electrovalent bond because positive metal kernel is attracted by the electrons around it so that is what a metallic bond is okay so now as a part of this video we have discussed what are chemical bonds why are they even formed what is ionic bond what is a covalent bond in covalent bond we have discussed the polar and non-polar covalent bonds we have discussed what are coordinate bonds and the metallic bonds right now chemistry as we all know is all about reactions okay reaction between atoms to form molecules and also only certain atoms combine to form only certain molecules okay scientists a long 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 time back had a very beautiful habit of asking this question of why 
So scientists had this question, why do atoms combine? Today we know that atoms combine to form molecules and we know a variety of them, okay? But they used to ask why and they used to answer also by giving certain theories. So scientists had this question that why are atoms combining and one such theory which tried to answer this question was a theory by Cossel and Lewis, okay? This theory tried to explain the most important question that why do atoms combine and this theory was based upon the inertness or nobleness of noble gases. Now what are these noble gases? The group 18 elements are called noble gases and we all know that okay and they are called noble gases because well they are noble which means they do not react or they do not form any compounds. They do not react with other elements or they form, do not uh, form any compounds with any other elements, right? Whereas, instead of them, all the other elements in periodic table react, okay? With some or the other element, but they definitely react. So, why are they reacting and why are noble gases not reacting? What do noble gases have which all the other elements do not have? And that is what this theory is based on. This theory basically says that 8 electrons in the balance shell is something that every element is craving. And this is something which noble gases already have. And because noble gases already have this, they do not need to react. Whereas all the other elements, because they do not have it, they are craving for it. And because they want to get 8 electrons in their outermost shell, they do the reactions which they do. Okay. So to complete this 8 electrons in their outermost shell, the elements can either do transfer of electrons, a complete give and take of electrons, okay, which happens in case of your ionic bonds, or they can take part in sharing of electrons, which happens in cases of covalent bonds, as we know. Basically, bottom line, all the elements want 8 electrons in their outermost shell, and because they want to do that, they're going to perform the chemical bonds, which we see around us, okay. Now, how many uh, electrons they are having in their outermost shell? So, as we see, the first group is having one electron in the outermost shell. The second is having two electrons in the outermost shell. Thirteen group is having three electrons, then four, then five, then six, then seven, then eight. Okay. So, noble gases are having eight electrons in their outermost shell. So, basically, they are done with life. But all the other elements are not having eight electrons in their outermost shell. So, depending upon their comfort which means depending upon the comfort of either transferring, which is giving and taking of electrons or sharing, they will achieve this 8 or octet in their outermost shell. And once they achieve octet, they become inert and hence they become stable. Okay. It is now important to understand that all the noble gases have 8 electrons in their valence shell, which means they have a complete octet, which apparently provides them certain stability. Whereas helium is having not 8, but 2 electrons in its outermost shell, and this configuration is called a duplet, which apparently also is a stable configuration, and this provides helium uh, atom a very stable configuration, and that is why hydrogen atom, which is having just one electron, tries to complete its duplet because, of course, completing eight electrons is going to be quite difficult for a hydrogen atom, so it tries to become or tries to achieve a duplet, just like your helium gas. Okay, now talking about a classic example of ionic compound, which is basically a sodium chloride. Okay. Now, this sodium chloride is a classic example for octet rule where both sodium and chlorine are trying to achieve a noble gas or 8 uh, electron configuration. By giving and taking electrons, we have sodium whose electronic configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6 and 3s1. And chlorine whose electronic configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1 and 3p, 3s2 and 3p5 okay now the rule says that we need eight electrons in the valence shell so if somehow sodium is able to give out this electron we get a total of eight electron in its valence shell which is the two subshell and it's going to be a good day for sodium atom right whereas in case of chlorine if it's somehow able to gain one electron it is going to be eight electrons in the three subshell and that again is a good day for chlorine so this happens it's a match made in heaven sodium gives out one electron which is taken up by the chlorine atom and becomes sodium chloride and hence it is an ionic compound which is formed by give and take of electrons on the other hand in case of chlorine molecule both of them are having seven electrons in their outermost shell by sharing one one electron each they both achieve eight electrons in their outermost shell and that gives this molecule extra stability because now both of them are having eight electrons which is the octet which is the inert gas configuration so this is a classic example of a covalent bond in which the octet rule is 
So the octet rule was a very celebrated theory of its time because it was actually able to explain bonding in many different compounds including water, ammonia, methane, okay, and many different compounds and the list is too long, okay. But as time passes, researches go on and it was later discovered that octet rule also has limitations okay it is not a very successful theory because it do it does have certain limitation and basically every theory has some or the other limitation of its own the main one being that it is based on the inertness of noble gases okay the base of this theory is that noble gases are inert they will never react because they are noble gases but xenon which is a noble gas does form compounds with fluorine okay it does form compounds with fluorine it does form compounds with oxygen and fluorine so basically the base of the theory itself is not correct okay more than that we have some compounds which are formed which do not have eight electrons in their outer motion and and still they are formed right first one we have configurations in which there are electrons less than eight in the outer motion of the central atom examples is beh2 here beryllium has only 4 electrons in its outermost shell. Example AlCl3, here Al has a total of 6 electrons in its outermost shell. Such configurations where the outermost shell does not have 8 electrons but only less electrons than that are called hypovalent configurations. Okay. Also we have compounds in which the central atom has electrons more than 8, for example SF6. In SF6, we have a total of 12 electrons in the outermost shell of sulfur and which is of course much higher than 8. And such configurations in which the electrons are more than 8 with the central atom are called hypervalent configurations. Okay, so we do have compounds which do not have 8 electrons in the outermost shell and they are still formed. Which basically tells us that 8 rule or 8 electrons in the outermost shell is not a necessity and is something which if it happens great but if it does not happen it does not define whether a molecule is going to be formed or not okay. So this was the main limitations these were actually the main limitations of the octet rule. Well the first thing is that this theory tries to ask certain questions. The question is that various different molecules okay occupy only a certain unique shape in space for example Methane molecule, for example, is always having a tetrahedral shape, right? Water molecule is always having a bent shape. Ammonia mo molecule is always having a triangular pyramidal shape. A molecule of BF3 is always having a triangular planar shape and plenty of other molecules which only have a certain shape in space, okay? But the question is why, okay? So this question of why these shapes is trying to be answered by the VSEPR model and it also helps us predict the shape of various different molecules which we don't even know, okay? So let's try to understand that. So what actually happens is that matter around us is made up of electrons, protons and neutrons and electrons are basically present in every system, okay? So electrons are a part of every system and they can be present in three different types. What are these three different types? The first type is that they can be present as lone pairs. Now what is the lone pair of electron? It is a pair of electron and they are localized on a certain atom. For example, if I talk about NH3, okay, ammonia molecule. Uh, ammonia molecule has three bond pairs, which is with each hydrogen atom, but one uh, lone pair of electrons are present on nitrogen atom, which is going to be staying at nitrogen atom, which is localized at nitrogen atom, which is not in the bonded situation, clear? Second one is the bond pair. Bond pair is, again, if I talk about ammonia, again, if I just, uh, rewrite this structure so there is this lone pair okay and these three are not just sticks okay they are not just like three solid sticks again they represent sharing of two electron each one bond means sharing of two electrons in a covalent bond right so these three are also representing two electrons but in the bonded situation clear so this again we have a single bond uh, we have two electrons of course double bond which means four electrons and triple bonds definitely means sharing of six electrons because one bond means two electrons, right? So in VSEPR model, we are going to be considering double, single and triple bonds exactly in one way, just like a bonded pair, okay? Because all these three are bonded pair of electrons. And the third type is a single or a singlet of electron, okay? When an electron is present just like in a single form, not in a paired state, right? So electrons are present in every system and these are the three main types and three only types rather in which electron can be present. Now, 
it's very clear that electron is going to repel electron because both of them are going to be having negative charges so electrons always repel each other which means they repel negative charges right now uh, this repulsion of electron is directly proportional to the number of electrons clear but in lone pair as you can see they are uh, belonging to a single atom they are not in a shared state between two atoms they are going to occupy much more space right that is why they are going to be much more repelling than bonded pair or single atom right in case of bonded pair again we have two electrons just like in lone pair but they are in bonded situation because they belong to two atoms now and that is why in bonded pair the repulsion is still there because again these are two electrons but they are still less than that of lone pair right singlet of course has the minimum repulsion because it is just a single electron comparatively it has much less repulsion compared to lone pair and bond pair so if i just write whatever i said a lone pair two lone pair repulsion okay if two lone pairs are together somehow the repulsion is going to be very very high because very very highly negative charges are present together and the repulsion is going to be so much higher okay is going to be the highest compared to a lone pair if it is somehow connected to a bond pair okay so a lone pair and a bond pair they will also have certain repulsion it's not like they will not repel at all but that repulsion is going to be little less comparatively to the lone pair lone pair repulsion right and the last one is the bond pair bond pair repulsion bond pair bond pair again they both are also uh, representing two electrons or bond pair also like double triple bonds they can be but the repulsion is again less quite less compared compared to that of lone pair lone pair and lone pair bond pair because of the presence of uh, sharing of uh, bond pair between two atoms and not just with one right so this is what we uh, this is the main usp of your uh, bsepr model and this is going to give shapes of or uh, various different molecules that we will see in the next few minutes. Coming back to the theory, these are the various postulates of your BSEPR model and uh, you can read all these postulates in your NCRTs. What is the main point of these different postulates written on the screen is one. In any molecule, okay, bonds and the lone pairs will align themselves in a way that repulsions are minimized and the distance between them is maximized again because they want to have a lower energy or a least energy state okay so as i already said electrons in any system can be in three different types lone pairs bond pairs and single state right now because of these because all these are electrons only so they're going to be repelling each other but they are smart enough to align themselves in a way that the distance between them should be maximized and hence the repulsion should be minimized and that is why we have only certain unique shapes in certain different uh, molecules that we see and now let's figure out the shape of certain molecules by the VSEPR theory. Okay, so any molecule which we talk about have two different kind of atoms. One is called a central atom, okay, and the other one is called the side atom all right for example if i talk about methane okay c is my central atom and hydrogens are my side atoms we'll consider them as b right so according to vscpr theory we divide the molecules into two kinds the first ones are the ones which do not have lone pairs pairs okay and the second ones which do have lone pairs okay so first we'll talk about the ones which do not have lone pairs and then we'll jump on to the ones which have lone pairs having the knowledge of the ones which do not have lone pairs so let's start now if i talk about the first one we have the first type which is a b2 which means one central atom and two side atoms clear which means two bonds are going to be formed by the central atom in this case, because we don't have any lone pair, the geometry or shape is always going to be like this. The angle is always going to be 180 degrees. The shape is always going to be linear. In this case, I'm going to use the word shape and geometry interchangeably because they can be used interchangeably here. But this is not going to be the case when I go to the ones which have lone pair and I'll tell you why in a while. Okay. And the example for you here is carbon dioxide molecule. Okay, so carbon dioxide molecule is something like this. It does not have any lone pair and is having a linear geometry. Central atom is your carbon, okay, and side atoms are your oxygen atoms in this case. Second one is your A, B, 3. One single central atom and three side atoms are there, which means single atom, uh, side, uh, central atom is forming three different bonds. Clear? In this case, the shape or geometry is always going to be trigonal planar geometry. It is planar which means it, can, it is not coming out or coming 
below the plane of paper okay and it is trigonal in nature so it is trigonal planar geometry okay planar geometry and uh, the angle is of course 120 degrees and the example for you is bf3 boron here is the central atom and three fluorine atoms here are the side atoms clear third one is your a b4 okay which means one central atom and four side atoms or four bonds need to be formed here now in this case we always have the geometry to be tetrahedral geometry okay whenever there's there's one central atom and there are four side atoms the geometry always definitely should be tetrahedral and the angle of tetrahedral is 109.5 degrees the geometry is tetrahedral okay and here the example is our very own methane right the fourth one is a b5 which means one central atom and five side atoms clear and the shape in this case is always going to be trigonal bipyramidal which means a is a central atom there's going to be a triangle of side atoms which is on plane okay just like your triangular planar that's no, uh, no difference is there but the other two will be above and below the plane okay this is trigonal trigonal by pyramidal okay and the example is pcl5 all right the last one is your a b6 in this case again your, there, you have one central atom which is A and you have six side atoms which means six bonds should be formed and here the geometry is like this A, four B's are going to be on the plane of paper and the other two are going to be above and below the plane okay and this geometry is also called octahedral geometry okay octahedral geometry and you can also call it square by pyramid because on the plane you have a square and you have bipyramidal, right? So square by pyramidal. The example is SF6. Is it clear? One most important thing which you should know is that the uh, bonds which are there on the plane, for example, here we have three bonds on the plane, okay, on the plane of paper, and that are called your equatorial bonds, okay? The ones which are above and below the plane are called axial bonds. This is also axial bond, this is also axial bond. These three are your equatorial bonds. Again, same in this case, these four are on the plane of paper. So, all these four are your equatorial bonds, okay? And the ones which are above and below the plane of paper are called your axial bonds. This and this are your axial bonds. Now, let's talk about the molecules which are the ones which have a lone pair and the same principles will apply. Let's see how that happens. Okay, so now let's understand what happens when we have a lone pair, okay? So we are going to consider the lone pair as just like another side atom only and we are going to represent it with the letter E, okay? So the first example here is A, B, 2, E. So just like we have when we had A, B, 3, okay, which means three side atoms, the geometry was what? A, B are going to be present at the three corners and this geometry is your trigonal planar. This is what we have discussed just five minutes back, right? The same principles are going to apply. We have three side atoms, okay? Two of the are B and one is a lone pair. Now, the shape should be trigonal planar, but because of the presence of lone pair, it is going to cause lone pair bond pair repulsion, okay? According to BACPR theory, that's what the lone pair is going to do. And it's going to shift these bonds much more closer to one another because of the repulsion that it's causing, right? And now, because these bonds are much more closer, the angle is no more 120 degrees and the shape is now bent, okay? So, if you notice carefully, the geometry is still trigonal planar, okay? I just arranged them in trigonal planar form only. But what happens due to the form, due to the presence of lone pair here, that is the repulsion, gives a different shape to the molecule, which is bent, okay? So, now we differentiate the meaning of geometry and shape here, as I said before. The example here is of SO2, okay? This is an SO2 molecule with one lone pair and the shape here is bent. Geometry is trigonal planar only. Second is A, B, 3, E. Okay, now in this case, 
we have four side atoms, right? So if we have four side atoms, simply the shape is going to be what? Or the geometry is going to be what? Tetrahedral, I think it's very clear to all of us, right? So I'll just arrange them just in that way. We have three B atoms and one is the lone pair. So the geometry is again tetrahedral here. But because of the presence of lone pair, it is again going to cause your lone pair bond pair repulsion and it is going to shift the bonds much more closer to one another and hence the shape is not tetrahedral but the shape is trigonal pyramidal it is going to be having a pyramidal kind of shape okay okay so because of the presence of lone pair these bonds are shifted close to one another right so to give an example for trigonal pyramidal we have the ammonia okay the ammonia molecule in which we have three bond pairs with three side atoms which is uh, hydrogen atoms and one is the lone pair and the shape is trigonal pyramidal okay moving on we have the next one which is this is the third one right yeah so we have the next one which is a b2 e2 now what happens in this case let's see again we have four side atoms okay and the shape should be what? It should be tetrahedral. So we just arrange them in this shape of being tetrahedral. So like this we'll arrange them. We have two B and two lone pairs. Now these lone pairs are going to do what? Now we have a lone pair, lone pair repulsion which is of course higher than lone pair, bond pair repulsion and we also have a bond pair, bond pair repulsion which is of course going to be the lowest, right? So now because of the lone pair, lone pair repulsion these two bonds are going to be shifted very much closer to one another and we have a bent kind of shape okay and the example is your water molecule okay so the shape is bent but the geometry is tetrahedral only clear all right the next one is your a b 4 e okay in this case, I have five side atoms, right? So it's it's almost like A, B, 5 in which my shape was, in which my, sorry, in my geometry was what? My geometry here was trigonal bipyramidal, right? So this is what my shape was like. In this case, I have one lone pair. So this lone pair, so of course, in this case, we have two types of bond. We have equatorial bonds, three equatorial bonds and two axial bonds here okay so the lone pair is going to occupy this place which means one of the equatorial bonds okay and it is going to be like this so we have four b's okay and one is a lone pair and this is the shape of the model and that is a c saw shape so i hope you have seen and played on a seesaw it used to be there in, in, in parks when you were little, right? So this is the shape of a seesaw and that is the shape which happens when we have an ABE, AB4E kind of a structure, clear? To give an example for seesaw, the example is SF4, okay? The molecule is having a seesaw kind of shape, okay? And with a, a lone pair present on the planar bond, okay? Next we have Four, right then we have the, yeah so the next one which we have is a b 3 e 2 now we have two lone pairs again the same geometry is there trigonal pyramidal okay trigonal bipyramidal the same geometry and we have two lone pairs now so again the same thing we'll draw okay now these three b's are going to occupy these positions okay the two axial and one equatorial and the other two equatorial positions are going to be occupied by the lone pairs and since because they're going to be causing uh, you know lone pair bond pair repulsion and the lone pair lone pair repulsion is going to be very very high we have this is the shape of the molecule which looks like a T right so it's going to be T shape molecule the shape is T shape the geometry again is trigonal by the middle only okay and the example for this is clf3 okay the molecule is having a t-shaped geometry now we have the last one in which we have six side atoms clear so i just clear this all out and then we'll talk about the last two ones 
All right. Okay. So the last one is when we have A, B, 5, E. We have six side atoms here. So when we used to have six side atoms, we had this kind of geometry. We have octahedral kind of geometry, right? Same thing, same principle is going to be applied. Octahedral geometry you will draw, okay? Equatorial bonds are going to be four and there will be two axial bonds. In one of the axial bonds is going to be the uh, lone pair and five B are going to be here, okay? So the shape is square because on the plane you have a square, right? Like this is a square on the plane. And the above and below you have uh, one is the lone pair, one is the side atom. So we have square, para, middle. Okay. So to give an example, we have the example of this as Br F5. Right? So the uh, molecule is having a square pyramidal geometry. The last one is A B4 E2. Again, we have six side atoms out of which four are atoms and two are lone pairs so same thing is going to happen okay b b b and b on the square planar structure and above and below are going to be lone pairs so lone pairs because uh, axial bonds are quite you know away from the equatorial bonds uh, that's why uh, it will be chosen by the lone pairs to be at the uh, axial bonds so as to you know maximize distance and to uh, minimize the repulsion there and this is the shape of the molecule and that is square planar and the example is XEF4. Is that clear? So this was the VSEPR theory which basically tries to say that every molecule wants to be in a stable state, less repulsive state and that is what going to happen when the electrons, the lone pairs, the bond pairs are going to move away from each other okay because so as to reduce repulsion and that was just the simple and sweet meaning of your VSEPR theory. Now before starting with what is a hydrogen bond let's first talk about what are polar covalent bonds okay so these are the values of electronegativity of the first and second period of periodic table uh, these are the values on the Pauling scale and it is quite clear to us that lithium is having the lowest electronegativity whereas Fluorine is having the highest electronegativity, right? So what is this electronegativity? Electronegativity is nothing but the tendency of any atom to attract the shared pair of electron toward itself. So we know how a covalent bonds we have sharing of electrons, right? So I'll just explain to you with an example. If I just draw a covalent bond between carbon and oxygen, okay, then the shared pair should lie exactly in between carbon and oxygen. That should be the case in the ideal case scenario, right? But as I can see, oxygen is much more electronegative than carbon, which means it is going to attract the shared pair of electron toward itself more, okay? Which means instead of lying in between C and O, the shared pair is going to be somewhat closer to the oxygen atom because of which there's going to be a polar situation created, which means poles, negative and positive poles are going to be created and oxygen is going to have a negative polarity, whereas carbon is going to be have, is going to have a respective positive polarity, okay? This kind of covalent bond in which we have poles created because of difference in electronegativity of the two, uh, you know, combining atoms, these are called polar covalent bonds, okay? Now, if we, on the same lines, if we just compare hydrogen bonds, uh, hydrogen as you can see is having the very low value of electronegativity of just 2.1, okay? If I just draw a comparison between hydrogen and fluorine, okay? Let's say we draw an HF bond, then again we would expect the shared pair to, uh, to lie in between H and F, okay? But because of huge difference in polarity and a very high electronegativity of fluorine, the shared pair will lie more, much more towards fluorine and hence because of that hydrogen will have a partial positive charge and fluorine is going to have a partial negative charge, okay? Now this is a charge situation or polar situation which is created. Please remember these are not ions like cations and anions, no, okay? These are just a polarity which is created which means a respective polarity of positive and negative which is created. Now, if I just place these HF bonds together, what do you expect? Because of the placement of these HF bonds together and there's a polar situation which is created, I would expect 
a kind of attraction between the positive and negative charges okay which means a kind of attraction between two different molecules of hnf okay because of the positive and negative polarity which they hold right and this my friends is called a hydrogen bond okay the most important thing which you guys have to remember is hydrogen bonds only exist between electro positive hydrogen and nitrogen oxygen and fluorine which means only hydrogen and nof okay just remember this mnemonic as nof and only nof hydrogen with nitrogen oxygen and fluorine can only form a hydrogen bond because of high electronegativity difference which lies between hydrogen and the atoms of nitrogen oxygen or fluorine okay now to give a few examples the most important example is water so water is a universal solvent having hydrogen bonding between two different molecules and it exists between atoms of oxygen and hydrogen okay again we have alcohol in which we have hydrogen bonding this is again an oh kind of hydrogen bonding between two different molecules in case of carboxylic acids again we have an oh kind of hydrogen bonding in case of ammonia we have an nh type of hydrogen bonding between two different molecules if we just mix ammonia and water together we will have again an oh or nh kind of hydrogen bonding which can exist okay so just to sum it up i can say that hydrogen bonds are strong bonds okay so of course we cannot compare them to the stronger bonds like ionic and covalent bond but they are stronger bonds uh, as compared to the london forces and the dispersion forces okay and they are strong enough to confer liquid properties to any compound that they have okay for example uh, water is a liquid okay glycerol glycol so again the amount of hydrogen bonding as it increases liquid can become more and more viscous okay and more most compounds which have hydrogen bondings are either liquids or solids they are possibly never never gases okay because again hydrogen bonds are strong bonds next uh we have types of hydrogen bonding okay so now in this example this is an example of ortho nitrophenol okay so here we see a tendency of hydrogen bonding or a capability of hydrogen bond between oxygen and hydrogen okay so just if you look carefully you can see that this hydrogen bond exists between oxygen and hydrogen of the same molecule right so hydrogen bond exist between oxygen and hydrogen of the same molecule these kind of hydrogen bonds are called intramolecular hydrogen bond right but in case of para nitrophenol okay there is no scope of hydrogen bonding inside or within the molecule but if i just keep two different molecules together now i see a scope okay now i see a hydrogen bonding which can exist here right so in cases like this where, where i have hydrogen bonding between two different molecules okay that kind of hydrogen bonding is called intermolecular hydrogen bonding okay so before ending and concluding this topic i just have one question which do you think has a higher boiling point the one which is intramolecular or the one which is intermolecular so you can just pause this video and think about the answer uh, the answer to this question is that of course if you just look at it carefully in case of intramolecular hydrogen bonding there is hydrogen bonding within the molecule right so there is no force of attraction which is binding the molecules together okay so there is nothing which is you know binding different molecules together the molecules are discrete within the molecules you are having hydrogen bonding but nothing is binding the molecules together whereas in case of intermolecular hydrogen bonding we have a force hydrogen bond which is binding different molecules together okay because of which intermolecular hydrogen bonded uh, compounds will have a higher boiling point the first and the foremost thing before even understanding what hybridization is that you should know it is just a theory okay it is not reality whatever we are going to study in as a part of this video is just a mathematical trick to explain bonding and that is what hybridization is okay so if some day someone asks you that you know can you see hybridization happening if you have a very good quality microscope or something just say no because hybridization is just a mathematical trick it does not really and actually happen so we know how we have different kind of orbitals right we have s orbitals which are spherical in shape we have p orbitals which is dumbbell shaped right and it is present in three different axes px py and pz 
we have d orbitals which is having this kind of a double dumbbell shape right and we have f orbitals which have a kind of cloudy or flowery kind of shape which i am not very well aware of so i won't be drawing it on the screen my point being that we have these different kind of orbitals which we have in which electrons can be present okay and we know how atomic orbitals combine to form molecular orbitals that also we know clear but the idea was that when atomic orbitals are going to combine okay they are not going to combine in the pure state like s this is the pure s this is the pure p these all are pure p then we have pure d orbitals okay so these pure orbitals are not going to combine to form bonds but before bond formation these pure orbitals are going to undergo some kind of mixing okay and this mixing of orbitals is going to result into new atomic orbitals which are called hybrid orbitals okay and these hybridized orbitals are going to have new set of energies and new set of properties and these orbitals are further going to take part in bond formation and that is what the entire idea of hybridization is okay all right so just to give it a little perspective this is the definition of hybridization which is mixing of atomic orbitals of equivalent energies to give rise to a set of new orbitals with new energies and properties is called hybridization okay so before playing any game you what well, the first thing what you do is you just go through the rules of the game similarly before understanding the hybridization part we will go through the rules of hybridization out of which the first one is combining atomic orbitals should have comparable energies right so this is one of the most important rules because you know you cannot combine s and d together because they have huge difference in energy okay you can combine s orbitals and p orbitals together because they are comparable in energy and energy is a very important factor so you which you always have to consider so combining atomic orbitals must have equivalent or comparable energies okay second rule is number of hybridizing orbitals must be equal to number of hybridized orbitals so of course if two or orbitals are participating we must be getting two hybridized orbitals if three are participating we must be getting three hybridized orbitals and i think that's quite simple the third one is only the atomic orbitals of the central atom having valence electrons will hybridize okay so example like ch4 methane okay the c is a central atom okay which is denoted by a and h the four h are side atoms okay so the central atom which is c here, c here in this case only that is going to undergo the process of hybridization the atomic orbitals of only carbon are going to hybridize and uh, and that too the ones which are having valence electrons okay we are not going to consider all the electrons because if we keep doing that well the game is never going to end okay so only valence electrons are going to be considered that too only of the central atom all right so no points for guessing which this orbital is this is our very own s orbital okay and it has the maximum capacity of two electrons right and this is also called non directional orbital why is it called non directional orbital because well it is an s orbital and it is spherical in shape and it is not pointing towards any specific direction right whereas if i talk about a p orbital a p orbital is dumbbell shaped okay and it is present in three different axes px py and pz the maximum capacity of p orbital being 6 because every orbital is having a total capacity of 2 and it is having three different orbitals so 6 is the total capacity here and it is highly directional why is it highly directional because it is pointing in three different directions in x y and z direction okay so if i talk about the mixing of s and p orbitals okay so s orbital is this and this is my p orbital okay so if i talk about the mixing of my x and p orbitals the first case scenario which i can have is the mixing of 1s okay with only 1p right so if i mix 1s and 1p together how many orbitals will i be getting just remember the rule the second rule said that whatever is the number of participating orbitals will be getting the exact same number of hybridized orbitals so if we mix 1s and 1p which is two orbitals together we will be getting two hybridized orbitals each of them is going to be sp hybridized okay and we are going to be left with two unhybridized p orbitals right these two are unhybridized and this is called sp hybridization okay so whenever we have an sp hybridization in what cases will we ha will we have this in the cases in which we have 
two bonds with central atom so whatever the central atom in case it is forming two bonds okay both these bonds are going to be sp hybridized bonds and these angle between these two bonds is going to be 180 degrees and the geometry is going to be linear okay all right in the second case scenario if i try to combine my 1s orbital okay with 2p that is also what something i can do right so this is p p and p so if i try to combine 1s orbital with 2p orbitals again in this case i will be getting three hybridized orbitals right all these are going to be sp2 hybridized because as my rule says number of combining is should be equal to number of hybridized so if three orbitals are combining i should be getting three hybridized orbitals right all these three are going to be sp2 hybridized and the last one is going to be a p orbital which is going to be unhybridized these this is going to be the case when we have a atom or a molecule in which we have a central atom forming three bonds right all these three bonds are going to be sp2 hybridized okay and the angle should be 120 degrees and the shape for a molecule like this is going to be trigonal planar okay the geometry here is trigonal planar in case of sp2 hybridization if in the last case we can have if I want to combine or hybridize one S and all the P's together, okay, this is my S and these are three different P's. If I decide to combine one S and all the P's together, I will be getting a hybridized orbital which will be having four hybridized orbitals. All of these will be sp3 hybridized orbitals, okay. And in this case, we are going to be having a molecule which is going to be central atom and we have four bonds all these four bonds are going to be sp3 hybridized and the angle is going to be 109.5 degrees because my shape or geometry here is tetrahedral okay so just to give you a closure we have sp hybridization okay in which we have one s and one p are mixing together okay the maximum capacity is going to be of course four and the structure is going to be linear okay in sp2 we have three bonds the structure or the shape is going to be trigonal planar okay three bonds are going to exist and sp3 which means four bonds so it's going to be tetrahedral chalo so moving on this is an s orbital okay which is spherical so we can well call it fat okay this on the other hand is a p orbital so it is long and we can kind of call it a little slim okay so this is a pure s orbital and this is a pure p orbital your hybridized orbital do not look like a pure s and pure p in case of sp hybridization your hybridized orbital is going to have 50 percent s character and 50 percent p character which means it is going to be 50 percent fat and 50 percent slim so it's kind of going to be like this it is going to be fat and also longer and slimmer like p in case of sp2 okay we have 33 percent of s character and 66 percent of p character which means our hybridized orbit our orbital is going to be somewhat longer and maybe a little less fat okay so it's going to be something like Whereas my sp3 orbital is going to have only 25% s character and 75% p character which means boy. This is going to be very slim and trim and very less fat. Okay, so it's going to be somewhat like this. Okay, so this is what my sp hybridized orbital looks like. It's 50% s and 50% p. This is what my sp2 hybridized orbital looks like which is having more of p character and little less of s character whereas this is what my sp3 hybridized orbital looks like which is having maximum p character and very little s character okay so maximum s character is that of sp orbital sp hybridized orbital and minimum is of sp3 hybridized orbital okay so when we talk about single double and triple bonds okay we know single bonds are sigma bonds 
double bonds are sigma and pi bonds and triple bonds are sigma and 2 pi bonds right sigma bonds are formed by the head on overlap of orbitals okay so we have head on overlap of orbitals like 2s orbitals can head on combine which is on the internuclear axis when they combine that is when a sigma bond is formed or let's say a head on combination of the 2p orbitals right this is also head on combination or we can also say an internuclear axis because this axis passes through the nucleus i'll just draw it again because it's kind of messed up so this axis which is passing through the nucleus of the two colliding orbitals okay is called the internuclear axis and when this overlapping happens head on which means on the internuclear axis we have a sigma bond which is formed when this kind of overlap happens sideways okay which means not on the internuclear axis like this sideways then the kind of bond which we are going to get is called a pi bond and the overlap is something like this okay and because the overlap area is not that high is not that efficient your pi bond is weaker in comparison to that of your sigma bond now as already discussed sigma bond is formed by head on overlap okay and pi bond is formed by sideways overlap what we just discussed is the is the shape of the hybridized orbitals right how fat and how slim they are now head on overlap can be done can be done by all the hybridized orbitals hybridized or even unhybridized orbital can do it all hybridized plus unhybridized can do head on overlap but when it comes to sideways overlap hybridized orbitals cannot do that why because this is what a sideways overlap looks like okay and uh, and these are your pure p orbitals whereas a hybridized orbital looks like this as already discussed okay so because of the fat lobes which are now present in the hybridized orbitals okay they cannot undergo sideways overlap hence pi bonds can never be formed by hybridized orbitals okay so whenever we have pi bond for example in c single bond c we do not have any pi bond right whereas in c double bond c we have one pi bond in this case we need to leave some p orbitals which are you know not hybridized so that we can combine we can use sideways overlap there in case of c triple bond c again we have only one sigma bond but the rest two are what are pi bonds again sideways overlap or pi bonds cannot be made by hybridized orbitals so we need to leave out extra p orbitals which are or pure p orbitals which are unhybridized in the unhybridized state which will be used for sideways overlap okay. so in systems like this in which we have conjugation okay of course the single bonds are there which are made by hybridized orbitals but we have to leave out the pure p orbitals here okay for all the carbon atoms so that they can undergo sideways overlap and form the pi bonds let's finally talk about the hybridization of ch4 or methane molecule okay so carbon is having carbon here is the central atom so we are going to be talking about hybridization of central atom and that to the valence orbitals of central atom okay so carbon is 1s2 2s2 2p2 so i hope you know how to write electronic configurations okay the valence shell here is this much so i will just write this this is 2s2 okay and this is 2p2 we have two electrons in the p now when hybridization is happening the central atom is excited okay so excited state looks like this we have 2s and we have 2p okay and whatever pairing electron is there that electron is going to jump to the vacant orbital and it is going to look like this okay because we need to form bonds okay so we have 2s and 2p and this is the excited state electronic configuration of the central atom now we are going to form sp3 hybridization here because we have as you see one two three four bonds and all these four bonds are single bonds right so we need s and 3p to be combining to form sp3 right so 1s and 3p are going to hybridize to form four sp3 hybridized orbitals okay 
each having one electron each and these are going to finally bond with hydrogen atoms okay which also have one electron each and that is going to result into your methane molecule okay so methane molecule is having an sp3 hybridization and the shape here is tetrahedral now let's see what happens in case of an ethene molecule okay in case of an ethene molecule we have a double bond which means we have a pi bond so we have three sigma bonds for every atom and one pi bond okay this carbon atom is forming three sigma bonds two with hydrogen and one with another carbon okay and one pi bond again this carbon atom is having three sigma bonds and one pi bond okay now i directly write the excited state electronic configuration of carbon which is this 2s and 2p okay this now i will only look at the sigma bonds for now because i know hybridization is only going to happen for sigma bonds because pi bonds cannot be formed by hybridized orbitals because of their fatty lobes right so how many sigma bonds are there we have only three sigma bonds so we need one two three that is why only 1s and 2p are going to hybridize together to form three sp2 hybridized orbitals okay and one p orbital is going to be left pure or unhybridized because this is going to be used for sideways overlap or formation of the pi bond okay so every carbon atom in your ethene molecule is going to be sp2 hybridized okay and this is going to form with a bond with hydrogen hydrogen we have two hydrogens and other last sigma bond is that of carbon it will be that of carbon okay so this is going to be the structure in which these are my sigma bonds or sp3 or sp2 hybridized bonds okay and every carbon is going to be left with one unhybridized p orbital which has not hybridized and that is going to be used for sideways overlap because well we need to form a pi bond right so this is the structure of a uh, ethene molecule the hybridization of carbon in ethene is sp2 hybridized and only this structure okay this structure only is going to be considered for your hybridization part and this is going to be having 120 degree angle which means this is trigonal planar okay so this this part is trigonal planar having 120 degree angle sp2 hybridization and unhybridized part is this which is left above and below for sideways overlap for formation of this pi bond finally we have a molecule of ethene okay in case of ethene every carbon atom is forming two sigma bonds and two pi bonds okay we have two sigma and two pi bonds only sigma bonds we will consider for hybridization so excited state carbon is having electronic configuration like this okay s and this is 2p and since we are only having two sigma bonds we have hybridization of 1s and 1p are going to hybridize to form two sp hybridized orbitals okay with one electron each and one is going to be having sigma bond with hydrogen and one is sigma bond with carbon okay so one sigma bond is with hydrogen one sigma bond with carbon that is done and we are left with two unhybridized p orbitals okay now these two unhybridized p orbitals are going to be used for formation of the pi bond which is there because pi bond cannot be formed by hybridized orbitals so this carbon single bond carbon with hydrogen and carbon are my sp hybridized orbitals okay now on each carbon atom we have two p orbitals left which are pure which are not hybridized right like this so now these two are going to do sideways overlap to form a, a one of the pi bonds and these two are going to overlap okay which are on the other plane to form this second pi bond so we have two pi bonds which is formed by the formation of the 2p unhybridized orbitals on each carbon atom and the rest of the sigma bonds are sp hybridized so now i can say my ethyne molecule is sp hybridized and it is linear in geometry okay so this was my 
uh, ethyne molecule and my methane, ethene, ethyne, all these are having these hybridizations. This is an atom of hydrogen, okay? So if someone ever asks you, where are electrons present inside an atom? Your answer would be quite simple. Electrons in an atom are present in various orbitals, which could be S, P, D, F, depending on the electron that we're talking about. Here we have a hydrogen atom. So in case of hydrogen, we have only one S orbital. So electron is present in the S orbital of the hydrogen atom. Okay. But if someday someone asks you, where are electrons present inside a molecule? To answer that question, we have this theory, which we are going to study today, which is called the molecular orbital theory. Now, when atoms combine to form molecules, atomic orbitals also combine to form molecular orbitals. In case which you see on the screen right now, we have two atoms of hydrogen and because electrons are present inside the atomic orbitals, they are also called the atomic orbitals or S atomic orbitals of hydrogen. Okay, So we can basically say that atomic orbitals of hydrogen atom combine to form molecular orbitals of hydrogen molecules. To be very simple, atomic orbitals and molecular orbitals differ by the fact that atomic orbitals are associated with an atom, whereas molecular orbitals are associated with a molecule. To be more precise, I can say that electrons in an atomic orbital are influenced by only one positive charge, which is the nucleus, and that is why they are called monocentric, whereas in case of molecular orbitals, the electrons are actually influenced by not one, but more than one positive nucleus, depending upon whatever is the molecularity of that particular molecule, and that is why they are called polycentric. So the most important question is how are orbitals combining, okay? So to understand this question, first let's understand what are orbitals. Orbitals according to quantum mechanics are nothing but wave functions which means they can be considered as waves which means no matter s, p, d or f orbital whichever orbital you're talking about is going to have a certain wave function associated with it. So they will since they are wave functions they will behave like waves and because waves can be added and subtracted they can also be added and subtracted that's why we practice something called linear combination of atomic orbitals in case of linear, we can use mathematical functions like addition and subtraction and that's why we can add and subtract the waves, okay? So how do we add and how do we subtract waves? So in case of waves, when the two waves are in the same phase, which means they are crest of one wave is overlapping with the crest of another and trough is overlapping with the trough of another. In that case, we can add the two waves together and what we get is a wave which is having an even higher amplitude, right? Uh, compa compared to the ones which were actually joining and that is called a constructive interference or we call it as psi1 plus psi2 because this is psi1, this is the first wave function, this is second wave function and this we have the resultant wave function. In case we have two different uh, wave functions in which we have the two wave functions are out of phase which means the crest of one is overlapping with the trough of another. In that case we have subtraction in the two wave functions and the resultant wave is going to have a very less amplitude or sometimes even no amplitude and that is called a destructive interference. This is called psi1 minus psi2. So we can actually add and subtract the waves or orbitals from each other and that is what we are going to practice and this is called linear combination of atomic orbitals and that is what we are going to practice in the further slides. So I've said this before, I'll say this again. Whenever we start with any game, the first thing which we'll do is talk about the rules. The rules of molecular orbital theory are only two and they are basically very, very important. The first one says that atomic orbitals of comparable energies and same symmetry can only combine, okay? And the second one says that number of atomic orbitals combining must be equal to number of formed atomic orbitals. So just for an example, if I take the combination of two hydrogen atoms, uh, as I can see, there are two hydrogen atoms. So of course, they are going to have same energies, not even similar, but same energies because both are 1s orbitals, right? So the first rule is well, right? And the second is number of combining atomic orbitals must be equal to number of formed atomic orbitals. And here in this case, I have two atomic orbitals combining. So I should be getting two orbitals uh, or molecular orbitals formed, okay? As I can see, one is having the energy higher than the combining atoms and one is energy having energy lower than the combining atoms, okay? The one which is having a lower energy is called the bonding atomic molecular orbital, okay? And since this is a, there's a sigma bond between two hydrogen atoms, okay? That is why it is called a sigma bonding molecular orbital. 
whereas the one which is having energy higher than the uh, recombining atoms is called anti bonding molecular orbital and it is called also called sigma star we denote the anti bonding molecular orbital with a star along with that okay sigma basically means it's single sigma bond and nothing else where a hydrogen molecule has a total of two electrons and and since every orbital has a capacity of two these two electrons will go into the bonding molecular orbital and never into the anti bonding molecular orbital because anti bonding is having a higher energy and every system wants to achieve a state of lowest energy so hydrogen molecule will always uh, love and recommend its electron to go into the bonding molecular orbital to reach a state of lower energy and basically stability so when this happens when hydrogen atoms combine we get a hydrogen molecule where the two electrons will go into the sigma bonding molecular orbital so in order to define them we have bonding molecular orbital the molecular orbital which has lower energy in comparison to the combining atomic orbitals are called bonding molecular orbitals or bmos and they are formed by the addition of the two wave function so here we have psi1 plus psi2 and we know how sigma and pi bonds exist right they're basically nothing but single and double triple bonds and both of them are examples of bonding molecular orbitals we have anti bonding molecular orbitals where the molecular orbital which has the energy higher than the combining atomic orbital okay and they are formed by the subtraction of the two wave functions so here we have psi1 minus psi2 and we denote a little star along with the sigma and pi bond to denote the anti bonding molecular orbital so we have sigma star and pi star we also have something called non bonding molecular orbitals now these are the bonding molecular orbitals which have equal energies as compared to that of your combining atomic orbitals okay and they are called nbmos or non bonding molecular orbitals and this is where the lone pairs go so lone pairs are the electrons which actually do not take part in uh, chemical combination and if they are not taking any part they should be having energy same as that of before so that is why they will be having energy just exactly same as of, that of combining atomic orbitals and they are called non bonding molecular orbital so conventionally z axis is always considered to be the internuclear axis and whenever we have a combination of atomic orbitals on the internuclear axis or along the internuclear axis we have a sigma bond which is formed and whenever we have a orbital combination which is not along the internuclear axis which means on either of the x or y axis then we have a pi bond that is formed okay so just like in case of sigma bonds we have sigma and sigma star which is bonding and uh, anti bonding molecular orbitals again in case of pi bonds we have pi and pi star sigma star and pi star are both the examples of anti bonding molecular orbitals and sigma and pi both are examples of bonding molecular orbitals so for any bond to exist the electrons will definitely have to go into the sigma bonding molecular orbital for any pi bond to exist the electrons must definitely go into the pi bonding molecular orbital it's not like electrons never go into the anti bonding they go into the anti bonding but the number of electrons in bonding should always be higher than the ones in the anti bonding okay so electrons being into, into the bmos stabilizes a molecule and the electrons being in a bmos destabilizes a molecule so to start with a very basic example we have a combination of two 1s atomic orbitals of hydrogen atom to form a hydrogen molecule and we have two molecular orbitals which are formed one is called sigma bonding and the other is sigma star anti bonding uh, it's basically sigma 1s okay because we have 1s electron in case of hydrogen atoms and we have sigma star 1s okay and both the electrons will definitely go into the sigma 1s bonding atomic uh, bonding molecular orbital and this is the case in case of hydrogen molecule but life is not as simple as hydrogen molecule we have other molecules which are not having just two electrons but of course more than two a lot more than two so let's study about filling of electrons in those cases to fill the electrons in any higher diatomic molecule we have an order which is followed and that order is written on the screen in front of you one most important thing which you guys have to remember is that whenever there is combination happening on the internuclear axis which is the z axis then we will be having a sigma bond formed and whenever we have a combination happening happening on the y or x axis we are going to have a pi bond which is formed okay the second most important thing which you have to remember is that whenever we have a bonding molecular orbital formed we will definitely have its anti bonding molecular orbital too so if we have a sigma star if we have a sigma 1s we are going to have a sigma star 1s if we have a sigma 2s we should definitely have a sigma star 2s if we have a pi 2px and pi 2py we should be having pi star 2px and pi star 2py if we have a sigma 2p 
z we should definitely have a sigma star 2p0 okay so whenever whatever number of bonding molecular orbitals are there the same number of anti bonding molecular orbitals should definitely be there too okay? if i talk about filling of electrons in other diatomic molecules then we have an order which is followed okay so in case of molecules till nitrogen atom we have this order which is followed and in case of molecules which are having higher electronegativity like that of oxygen and fluorine we have this order which is followed okay so if i specifically talk about the nitrogen molecule we have n2 and total electrons in n2 is 14 because one nitrogen atom is having seven electrons so if i start filling 14 electrons in this order i will be having 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 electrons have been fulfilled now i have to remember that electrons are always filled according to the three rules which is hans rule of power principle and pauli's exclusion principle so which means i have to start from the very very low energy molecular orbital and then go towards higher now while filling the 2px and 2py i will fill it like this means the 2 1 will be singly filled first and the pairing will not happen unless all the orbitals on the same energy level have been fulfilled that is your hans rule okay so i will be filling it like this now i'll be pairing them and i have filled a total of 12 electrons already i have to still fill two more electrons so those electrons will go into the sigma 2pz and this is my molecular orbital electronic diagram of n2 molecule okay so in this case as you can see the last two electrons go into the sigma 2pz and they are in paired form because they are in paired form n2 is not magnetic so if the two electrons which go into the last uh, molecular orbital are unpaired then the resulting molecule is actually paramagnetic in nature and if you want to know what the meaning of paramagnetic is i'm linking a video below and you can watch that and you can understand that so in case of other molecules where we have unpaired electrons into the outermost shell we can have a property of paramagnetism okay so if i talk about oxygen molecule here in this case i have to fill a total of 16 electrons and oxygen atom is having a total of 8 electrons right so if i start filling the electrons from the very bottom i will be filling it in the same order just like as i did before okay and this so I have filled a total of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 electrons. I have to six still uh, fill 6 electrons, right? So 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and 6. So the last two electrons present in the sigma uh, into the pi star 2px and pi star 2py are actually unpaired electrons. That is why O2 molecule is actually paramagnetic in nature. Okay. So now this is the order of filling of electrons uh, for all the diatomic structures that you have seen. And moving on, we will understand what is the meaning of bond order and how is it related to bond length and bond dissociation energy. If we talk about the stability of bonds, electrons being in bonding molecular orbitals makes a molecule much more stable in comparison to when the electrons are present in anti-bonding molecular orbitals. So while filling, we have seen that we do fill electrons in anti-bonding. We have been filling electrons into the sigma star and pi star, right? So which basically means that for a molecule to be stable, the number of electrons in bonding molecular orbitals must be higher than the anti-bonding molecular orbitals, okay? So now, we need to understand what is bond order. Number of bonds present between two bonded atoms is the bond order. So in case of your carbon single bond carbon, the bond order is 1. In case of carbon double bond carbon, the bond order is 2. And in case of carbon triple bond carbon, the bond order is 3. If we talk about the mathematical formula of bond order, it is half multiplied by number of electrons in bonding molecular orbital minus the number of electrons in anti-bonding molecular orbital. Okay, So we'll understand how to find the bond. So to find out the bond order in case of any molecule, we need to first fill the molecular orbital energy diagram. In case of nitrogen, we have just filled it. Okay, So we'll find out the bond order here. Bond order is nothing but half multiplied by number of electrons in bonding minus number of electrons in anti-bonding. Right? So in case of nitrogen molecule, we have half multiplied by number of electrons in bonding is sigma 1s is bonding, sigma 2s is also bonding, pi 2px and pi 2py and sigma 2pz is also bonding right so we have a total of 10 electrons in bonding minus we have a total of 1 2 3 4 electrons in anti-bonding because these are sigma star and pi, sigma star again right so we have 4 electrons in anti-bonding we have half multiplied by 6 and the answer is 3 so the bond order of n is 
three, which means it is n triple bond n, which is true. We know that nitrogen bonds are double uh, a triple bond with nitrogen atom, and hence we can find out the bond order for any other molecule. If we talk about oxygen, which we just did here, okay, in case in case of oxygen is going to be half multiplied by one two three four. I'm counting the bonding ones, right? So one two three four five six seven eight and nine ten. So ten minus one two three four five and six. So it is six, right? So that is going to be four divided by two, which is equal to two, which means the bond order of O two is two, which means there are two bonds between two atoms of oxygen. And that whenever the bond order is equal to zero or it is having a negative value, then the molecule that we are talking about does not exist. For example, if I talk about the helium two molecule, we know that the molecule does not exist, right? So if we try to prove it with the help of the energy diagram, the number of electrons in helium two molecule is going to be equal to four. So if I fill the electrons here, one, two, three, four, the bond order comes out to be equal to half multiplied by two minus two, since two electrons are in the bonding and two into the antibonding, we have zero bond order, which means HE two molecule does not exist. Okay. So whenever we have a bond order which is zero or negative, it clearly means that the molecule which you are talking about does not have any existence. So as it is clearly visible that as the bond order increases from one to two to three, the bond become much more stronger, which means the two atoms are going to be much more closer to each other, and the bond is going to be much more stronger. So as the bond order increases, okay, from one to two to three, the bond length is going to decrease because of course the atoms are coming much more closer to each other and the bond energy is going to increase because well since atoms are coming much more close the bond order increasing the bond energy is also going to increase so i hope we understand the entire concept of molecular orbital theory it is a very very important theory even today and we still have discussions over uh, molecular orbital theory even today so the valence bond theory was given by hitler and london long back but this theory is also based on the quantum mechanical model okay which considers orbitals to be nothing but waves okay which means orbitals can be represented by a wave function which is psi and orbitals also behave like waves okay so what is the main feature of the wave which we consider orbitals also to exhibit the main feature is interference okay now what is this interference as already discussed before interference is nothing but the combination of waves so basically we can add or subtract the waves and because we are going to use addition and subtraction as mathematical functions we can call this linear combination of atomic orbitals when we talk use the word linear we can use functions like addition and subtraction only we cannot use uh, functions like uh, multiplication or division okay so because we are adding and subtracting the waves together we call it linear combination of atomic orbitals now how do we add or subtract the waves okay so when the two waves that we are talking about okay are in the same phase which means the crest of the wave the crest is this upper part the part which goes up okay is called the crest and the part which goes down is called a trough so when the crest of one is overlapping with the crest of another and the trough of one is overlapping with the trough of another okay we have two waves like this psi1 and psi2 when uh, there is a crest crest overlap and trough trough overlap in that in that case we say that both the waves are in phase okay and when two waves which are in phase they combine we get a resultant wave which is having an amplitude even higher than the ones which used to combine together and this is called a constructive interference which means that there's there has been an addition which happened okay and this is kind of an addition of the two waves which were uh, initially combining the same thing can happen on a different line which means we can have two waves which are in opposite phases to each other which means they are out of phase okay out of phase happens when the crest of one okay is overlapping overlapping with the trough of another when this kind of situation happens we have a kind of subtraction which happens okay between the two waves and we get what we get is a resultant wave which is having an amplitude even smaller than the combining waves and this is called a linear combination in subtraction so this is psi1 minus psi2 and this is psi1 plus psi2 okay since both these are addition and subtraction both these are linear combinations only one linear combination is resulting in a kind of 
constructive interference and the other one is resulting in a destructive interference okay so in the same lines on the same lines we can combine two different orbitals maybe we can combine s s orbitals together s p orbitals combine together we cannot combine s and d orbital together because they are of very different energies and we can only combine orbitals of similar energies okay so on the same lines if we try to combine orbitals together thinking of them as waves we'll start first with the s s overlap okay so as already discussed uh, when the overlap happens along the internuclear axis we call it as a sigma bond okay so this is the internuclear axis which means we generally consider it as a z uh, z axis is the internuclear axis convention is this only now when we have two s orbitals okay so one this is also an s orbital and this is also an s orbital when two s orbitals combine okay or overlap because since whenever there is an ss overlap it is always going to be a sigma bond because s is not uh, it's s is basically a spherical bond okay so it's always going to be on the internuclear axis it's never going to be outside the internuclear axis now when we do an ss overlap considering that both of them are having the same phase it could be positive positive or negative negative okay in that case we have a constructive overlap and the resultant orbital is going to have a higher electron density okay so amplitude is something which is analogous to the electron density so when we are combining two s orbitals which are in the same phase the resultant wave is going to have a higher electron density and of course two nucleuses are going to be there and this is the resultant orbit okay on the same lines when we have an ss overlap when the two combining orbitals are in the different phase okay one is positive and the other is negative please remember this positive and negative are not charges but the phases okay do not consider them as charges so when this kind of overlap happens on along the internuclear axis what we get is a resultant wave which is out of phase which means it is going to be something like this okay they are going to be repelled from each other kind of repulsion happens and we have a nodal plane a nodal plane is a plane in which there is absolutely no uh, probability of finding any electron density and as you can see here we have no nodal plane okay but here we have one nodal plane which is formed and this kind of uh, orbital ss overlap is not something which is formed and this is what we basically call anti bonding molecular orbital about which we are going to study in the molecular orbital theory we can also do the same thing in case of p orbital okay when there is going to be a pp overlap so when we do a pp overlap in a sigma bond so if we want a sigma bond to be formed along the pp uh, along the internuclear axis okay so this is the internuclear axis i'll just draw it again because it's kind of messy so since this is the internuclear axis this is one p orbital and this is the other p orbital okay consider it as considering that the same phase is combined this is positive this is negative this is positive okay so because positive and positive are going to combine this is going to be a constructive interference right so the resultant wave is going to have a higher electron density in between this lobe okay and this is a bonding molecular orbital whereas we could have an pp overlap okay a sigma pp overlap rather i should say which could have been out of phase which means a positive one would have been interacted with the negative one okay and if this kind of overlap happens we again have a kind of anti bonding molecular orbital which is formed which basically repel each other we again have a nodal plane here between the two orbitals okay and this is the anti bonding molecular orbital okay again when we have a pp pi bond which is formed okay in cases of pi bond we know that we have a sideways overlap which takes place right so of course it is never along the internuclear axis that's why it is a pi bond so when pp overlap happens and this overlap along the pi bond is actually a in phase overlap okay so a positive phase is going to interact with the positive one a negative is going to interact with the negative one we get a resultant wave or an orbital which is having this kind of electron density okay positive and negative we still have a nodal plane here okay but we have electron density above and below the plane this is called the bonding molecular orbital in case of pi bond okay we call this as a pi above you call this one as a sigma and this one as a sigma star okay now in case of pi bonds when we have a bonding which is out of phase okay 
in case of a sideways overlap it could be something like this positive interacting with a negative and negative interacting with a positive when this kind of overlap happens which is which means it is out of phase we get again something like this okay we have a nodal plane and there is absolutely no electron density which is found because since these two combining orbitals are actually repelling each other and what we get is an anti-bonding molecular orbital. We also call it, call it as pi star. Okay. So these are the interactions, the interactions of various orbitals together considering the orbitals to be wave functions. We have various linear combinations which can be formed and all this is a part of valence bond theory. So we have discussed about something called the octet rule. Okay, The octet rule is a theory put forward by Cossel and Lewis which basically tries to answer one of the most important questions that why do atoms even combine to form molecules. Okay, This theory is based upon the fact that all the atoms are trying to achieve something which these noble gases have which is 8 electrons in the valence shell and we call these 8 electrons in the valence shells as octet. And all the elements in periodic table are only trying to achieve this octet configuration so that they become just as stable as the inert gases and that is why bonds form. In special cases with hydrogen and lithium, these two elements are trying to achieve the noble gas configuration of helium atom which is basically 2 electrons in the outermost shell which is also called a duplet. The point being that all the elements in periodic table are only trying to achieve 8 electrons in their outermost shell or in some cases 2 electrons in their outermost shell by give and take of electrons which is forming ionic bonds or by sharing of electrons which is by forming covalent bonds. Now since this theory only talks about the number of valence electron that an atom has, okay, Lewis suggested a representation in which we can represent various elements with respect to number of valence electron that they have. For example, hydrogen is having electronic configuration of 1s1, okay. It has only one electron in the valence shell, so hydrogen can be represented by this. So the small dot represents one electron in the valence shell of hydrogen atom. In case of sodium, we have electronic configuration as 1s2, 2s2, 2p6 and 3s1. Again, there the third shell is the valence shell and again it has only one electron in the valence shell. So sodium also can be represented with only one dot which represents one electron in the valence shell of sodium atom. In case of carbon on the other hand, the electronic configuration is this. Okay, Here we have four electrons in the valence shell. So carbon can be represented like this with four dots which represents four uh, electrons in the valence shell. In case of nitrogen atom, we have electronic configuration as 1s2, 2s2 and 2p3. We can represent it with 5 dots which represent 5 electron in the valence shell. In case of oxygen, we have 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. Okay. Now we have 6 electrons in the valence shell. So oxygen can be represented by 6 dots which represent 6 electron in the valence shell. So according to the octet rule, the atom wants 8 electrons in the valence shell, okay? So either by give and take or by sharing, it has to achieve 8 electrons or in case of hydrogen, 2 electrons in the valence shell. Now in case of hydrogen, what it can do is, it can share its one electron with another monovalent atom, which means an atom which is again ready to share only one electron. Let's say another hydrogen atom. And that is how a covalent bond is formed between two hydrogen atoms, okay. So both these two are having one one electron each and they want to achieve a duplet which means two electrons. So they will just share these two electrons with each other, okay. And that is how a hydrogen single bond hydrogen where a single bond represents a sharing of two electrons is formed between two hydrogen atoms, right. In case of sodium on the other hand, we need eight electrons in the valence shell. So that can happen if this 1s or 3s1 electron is somehow moved out of the system, okay? And that can happen if sodium forms an ionic bond in which it is giving away its one electron and is now left with a total of 8 electrons in the valence shell. 6 plus 2 is 8 electrons in the valence shell. And that is why sodium forms ionic compounds and not covalent bonds because it is getting its electrons by giving away its electron totally, right? Now, in case of carbon, as you can see, carbon is having a total of 4 electrons in its valence shell. It will be quite difficult for carbon to gain 4 electrons or give away its 4 electrons, right? 
So that is why carbon actually shares its electrons with four different atoms or basically it needs to form four bonds in order to have eight electrons in its valence shell. So carbon forms four bonds okay, to achieve eight electrons and that is why in case of let's say methane we have carbon which is having four electrons sharing the other four electrons with other hydrogen atoms or any other monovalent atoms for that matter. Okay, again having one one electron each and that is the Lewis dot structure of methane. So all these shared electrons belong to all the atoms in between which they are being shared. Okay, and this is the Lewis dot structure of methane. So every hydrogen is having a duplet which means two electrons and the carbon atom is now having one, two, three, four, five, six and seven, eight electrons and that is why methane is a stable species according to the octet rule. Okay, so basically the point is that carbon needs to form four bonds. Each bond represents sharing of two electrons. In case of nitrogen, we have a total of one, two, three, four, five electrons and it needs to form three more bonds in order to get eight electrons, right? Similarly, in case of oxygen, it has one, two, three, four, five, six electrons and it needs to form two more bonds in order to get eight electrons in its outermost shell. So as already seen, nitrogen needs to form three bonds, which means in case of ammonia molecule, let's see, nitrogen is having a total of five electrons in its valence shell and it needs to form three more bonds or it needs to actually have three more electrons in its valence shell to have a total of eight, right? So it's going to form its bonds with hydrogen atoms, three hydrogen atoms rather. And now this is the Lewis dot structure of ammonia molecule. As you can see, every hydrogen atom is having a total of two electrons or duplet and the nitrogen, having, uh, nitrogen atom is having a total of eight electrons. So this molecule is also stable by the octet rule. Now these two electrons, as you can see, are not shared, shared between any hydrogen atoms, right? So these two electrons are localized at only the nitrogen atom and that's why we call them lone pair electrons, okay? So they are lone pair, which means they are only present on the nitrogen atom and they are not used in any kind of sharing. Whereas these three electrons, okay, have been shared with the three different hydrogen atoms. That is why they are called the bond pair electrons, okay? So we have three bond pairs and we have one lone pair electron here. Similarly, in case of oxygen, we have six electrons in the outermost shell. So it needs to complete eight electrons by sharing two more electrons or by forming two more bonds. Please note that here we are only talking about the covalent bonds and we, have, we are not talking about any ionic bond because we are talking about sharing of electrons only. Okay, So oxygen is going to share two more electrons and for that it needs to form two more bonds. Let's say it's for, it forms another bond with oxygen atom only. So both the oxygen atoms are having a total of six electrons, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. And both these atoms are going to be having its eight electrons complete. I'm sorry for the way this picture is being made, but I hope you understand the meaning, okay? So it's having one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight electrons. And this also is having one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight electrons. And that is why we have oxygen, double bond oxygen, because oxygen needs to form two bonds, right? Where each bond means sharing of two electrons. Now, to be very clear, we can understand how carbon is having a total of four electrons at, and it needs to get eight electrons. And for that, it forms four bonds. So whatever is the number of electrons it requires, that is the number of bonds it should form, okay? Nitrogen, on the other hand, is having a total of five electrons, one, two, three, four, five. And it needs three more electrons, so it is going to form three covalent bonds, okay? Again, oxygen is having a total of six electrons, so it needs two more electrons, so it needs to form two more covalent bonds. So we have seen how whatever is the number of electrons the, carbon, uh, the atom requires, that is the amount of, that is the number of covalent bonds it should form, okay? Now, in case of nitrogen, it is going to have, it is going to form three bonds. So if nitrogen is forming three bonds with nitrogen or with, let's say, hydrogen or whatever, okay, that is great. That is something which is, which should happen in the normal case scenario. But if somehow nitrogen is forming four bonds, because it can form, right? Because we know that nitrogen is having one lone pair, which is present on nitrogen atom, which is not taking part in any bonding. And it can also take part in bond bonding if it is also involved in bonding and then in that case nitrogen is going to form four bonds and if that happens 
nitrogen is going to get a positive charge because it is forming one extra bond than what is required so it is going to get one plus positive charge okay and this positive charge is called the formal charge of nitrogen atom in case nitrogen forms any less than what is required which means three are required if it is forming two bonds only in that case we get a negative charge on nitrogen atom because now we have one extra electron free if we are only forming two bonds and only two are required in bonding one extra is left out okay and we have a negative charge and this negative charge is called the minus formal charge of nitrogen atom similarly in case of oxygen atom as you can see it should form two bonds oxygen should form two bonds either with oxygen atom or let's say with carbon atom okay so whatever the number of whatever atom it forms bonds with it should definitely form only two bonds okay if oxygen is somehow bond, uh, forming three bonds because again oxygen can also form three bonds because it is having a total of two lone pairs left out okay which are not taking part in any bonding so if it is forming one extra bond other than two it is going to get a positive formal charge now having understood what is the physical meaning of formal charge let's talk about the mathematical formula for finding out the formal charge so mathematical formula formal charge is number of valence electrons in free atom free atom means when it is in the not bonded situation okay minus number of lone pair electrons minus half the number of bond pair electrons okay so i hope it's clear to us with an example it will be even more clearer so we have an example of ozone molecule ozone molecule we have three different oxygen atoms and we have to find the formal charge on each oxygen atom okay so oxygen atom 1 oxygen atom 2 oxygen atom 3 with the physical definition which we just studied we understand that oxygen should form two bonds in normal case scenario for it to have a zero formal charge okay so oxygen 1 is forming two bonds which is the normal case scenario so oxygen 1 should be having a zero formal charge okay oxygen 2 is forming one two three bonds okay one two and three bonds which is one extra than what should be normally there okay so oxygen 2 should be having a plus one formal charge whereas the oxygen 3 is forming just one bond which is one less than what should be normally there which is two bonds so oxygen 3 is having a minus one formal charge now to find out the same answer with respect to the formula we have in case of oxygen 1 okay number of valence electrons in free atom so in case of oxygen atom the valence electrons are always 6 so 6 minus number of lone pair electrons so lone pair electrons in case of oxygen 1 is 1 2 3 4 electrons right so 6 minus 4 minus half into number of bond pair electrons so the oxygen one is actually forming two bonds which means 1 2 3 4 4 so four electrons are actually involved in bonding so we have multiplied by 4 so we have 6 minus 6 0 so zero is the number uh, formal charge in case of oxygen one which we have already understood by the physical definition but i think it is important to understand by mathematical definition also in case of oxygen two okay the number of free valence electrons remains the same in the free atom minus number of lone pair so lone pair for oxygen is, oxygen two is only two okay minus half into number of bond pair so actually now the bond pairs is 1 2 3 4 Five six. So because it is forming three bonds, right? So we have six bond pair electrons. So this is here, and we have six minus five is one or plus one. So oxygen two is forming a plus one formal charge. In case of oxygen three, we have six minus here number of lone pairs is what one two three four five six. Okay. So six minus half into number of bond pairs so because is forming only one bond the number of electrons in one bond is always 2 so it is 2 okay so it is 1 6 minus 7 it's minus 1 okay so this is how we can find out the formal charge on any given atom in any given molecule using this mathematical formula if you have any doubts in this video please comment that down below i'll try to answer that so for more videos like this keep watching thank you so much